calling to order the regular meeting of the Solvang City Council for August 14, 2017. Will you call the roll, please? Councilmember Deuce? Present. Jameson? Here. Toussaint? Here. Zimmerman? Here. Mayor Richardson? Uh, here. Mr. Zimmerman, would you lead us in the pledge, please? First thing on the agenda is a presentation by the Community Home Energy Retrofit Project uh, and the Empower Santa Barbara. We'll present a 50 home challenge, a joint initiative between CHIRP and Empower Santa Barbara County to retrofit 50 homes to make them more energy efficient. I've asked them here to make the presentation. Uh, seems to be a, a good project, so if you'll step up and, and introduce yourselves. Uh, good evening, Mayor Richardson and council members. My name is Marissa Hansen. I work for the County of Santa Barbara's Empower program, and I'm here tonight with Devin Hartman, um, Executive Director of the Community Home Energy Retrofit Project, or CHIRP for short. Um, thanks for having us here tonight to talk about the 50 Home Challenge. As you mentioned, it's a joint initiative between the county's Empower program and um, CHIRP. So just to give you a bit of background, um, the uh, Empower program was launched by the County of Santa Barbara in late 2011. Um, we offer, the program offers wraparound services to homeowners who are interested in making energy efficiency upgrades to their home. Um, and the services that we offer include free, uh, free energy coach home assessments, um, access to rebates of up to $5,500, low interest financing, um, and qualified contractors. Um, so those are just some of the, the services and resources that we'll be bringing to, from the county to the 50 Home Challenge. Um, Empower's had a bit of success and we are really striving to, to achieve even greater impacts. Um, CHIRP is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, they are currently leading a community-wide program to help achieve aggressive goals to improve energy efficiency in buildings. Um, they've been extremely successful in several areas in California um, at energizing communities to complete a significant number of home energy retrofits um, in a really targeted area. Um, through a really unique approach um, to deep community engagement and education. Um, their first initiative was in Claremont, California, where they were able to complete over 400 um, home energy retrofits. So the goal of the 50 Home Challenge is to serve more residents and create a larger impact. Um, the joint initiative is aimed at combining the services and resources that Empower provides with um, CHIRP's really unique uh, neighborhood approach. Um, to engaging and educating an entire community on the benefits and opportunities around energy efficiency. Um, and the ultimate goal is to inspire 50 single family homeowners um, to take action and retrofit their homes. Um, on top of that, by providing a solid stream of energy efficiency projects for contractors, we're hoping to um, have uh, create jobs within the local contracting industry and create a positive economic impact within the community. Um, and create true market transformation. So homeowners are requesting energy efficiency projects along with remodels and contractors are integrating energy efficiency into their regular suite of services. So the 50 Home Challenge is a pretty great opportunity for individual homeowners and the community at large. Um, homeowners will have access to the Empower Energy Coach and free home, home energy assessments, um, financial incentives, and um, low interest unsecured financing to help reduce the overall and upfront costs of projects. They'll also benefit from reduced projects, project costs that can be, be achieved by um, completing a large number of projects at once. Um, and of course, reduced energy usage and improved comfort, health, and safety of their homes. Um, from a community-wide standpoint, um, the 50, 50 Home Challenge has the potential for job creation in the local construction industry, as I mentioned. Um, there are also studies that show that green rated homes sell at n four to nine percent above um, comparable homes. Um, so there's potential for increased property values. Um, we'll also be directing hundreds of thousands of dollars of worth of marketing, education, outreach, and other resources um, towards the community. So it's a great marketing opportunity. Um, being able to showcase a community improvement effort of this scale um, is certainly worth media attention and bragging rights, we think. 
Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Devin now to talk a bit about the origins of CHIRP, his organization, um, some of the successes, and what we really hope to replicate here in Solvang. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Mayor Richardson, members of the council, thank you so much for having us here to talk about this opportunity. I really wanted to, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm the executive director of CHIRP, the Community Home Energy Retrofit Project. This organization came into being in 2010 when I was getting ready to retire from 35 years of running my architecture and construction company in Claremont. Hartman Baldwin Design Build. We decided to get together to focus on energy efficiency education because it turned out that since I knew an awful lot about buildings, I knew enough to know that technology in terms of energy is not really the problem these days. The problem is lack of education in our communities. And so we formed a nonprofit educational organization to be able to address that problem. So if you go to the mall these days and you ask people which sector in the country uses the most energy, it'd be unusual if the response were buildings. Normally speaking, you would hear factories or transportation. But in fact, the building sector uses far more total energy in the United States than any other sector. 75% of all electricity generated in this country goes to keeping our lights on and our heating and air conditioning systems running. And as you notice on this graphic, surprisingly, residents use more than commercial buildings around the country. And so that creates, obviously, an extraordinarily difficult marketing problem and an education problem because in California, we have 13 million households so we have to have 13 million different conversations with people to kind of unpack the opportunities around energy efficiency. So in the state of California, this statement that we're from the government and we're here to help you is not an oxymoron where it has to do with energy. Starting back in 2006 with Schwarzenegger, he signed into act the first in world global warming initiative called AB 32. So it's a requirement in the state that every city, as you know, have an energy action plan so that we can start saving money through energy efficiency. Jerry Brown, back in 1978, started Title 24 Energy Codes, those things that as builders we used to hate. But as I look back now, there's over $80 billion in the state that's been saved through energy efficiency in California. And it has created an incredible opportunity, especially around things like Energy Upgrade California and Empower, because now the utilities and the counties have gotten together to incentivize our building owners with millions of dollars of rebates, loans, incentive programs. So we know that through energy efficiency, there are literally trillions of dollars that are yet to be untapped through energy efficiency. And that's a very rich offering that we have from the state. But if you go to the mall today and ask anybody if they've heard about Energy Upgrade California, or if in Solvang they know that there's $5,500 in rebates available if they put insulation and retrofit their house and redo their duct system, that's a shock to people, to most people. So as we can see here, we have a rich offering at the top and we have our communities and building owners down at the bottom. And this is what we call barrier to market transformation, which is the lack of understanding of what the opportunity is around energy efficiency in the building sector. So that's where we reside at CHIRP, is communicating to homeowners, getting the word out, and helping them understand what these opportunities are, are around energy efficiency. So, at CHIRP, we've developed a number of initiatives, like the 50 Home Challenge, and we have a roadmap to net zero. So we go and we talk to cities and homeowners and help them understand what the roadmap to net zero does look like and what the economic opportunities are that are embedded in that pre and post retrofit energy picture. So we surround the city with initiatives, contractors, we're training realtors and appraisers. We have a CHIRP Realtor Mentoring Program. 
We educate and do in-service trainings in terms of the opportunities around energy efficiency at the city level and at the community organization level. We help coordinate with rebates and financing. The county right now is offering very um, uh, favorable financing rates at 3.9 percent. And ultimately speaking, we're also working on bringing local so solar manufacturing facilities to cities, but that's another story. So we have an, a, a very complete city engagement model, and we would like to be in discussion with Solvang because the County of Santa Barbara would really like to use this as an impetus to go deeper with the energy retrofit projects that they've been working on in Santa Barbara. This is our mayor, Sam, and this is our head of planning in the city of Claremont. They got in support of us when we set down a big, hairy, audacious goal of retrofitting 130 residences in our community. So we actually created signs and we passed them out at city council meetings once people started retrofitting their building and they started putting signs around the, uh, the city. And so we have signs, uh, <coughs> for, for example, um, Beverly still has her first sign. Uh, she did this five years ago and she still has sign number three. We have signs cropping up all over town. And, and then people have um, gone on from energy efficiency to water uh, efficiency and thinking about water because we're concerned about all of that. This particular photograph I love because this is our entire city council with our chirp shirts on at the 4th of July Day Parade because we were one of the honored groups in Claremont three years ago. And they've been a huge supporter of this. We have an internship program with our local colleges. So we have lots of students working with us. We actually uh, celebrate energy efficiency with a 4th of July Day Parade. We have lots of homeowners because now we have had over 400 retrofits, so we have a lot of people who've gotten on the bandwagon. We actually, when we got to 130 mark in Claremont, we actually created an energy efficiency party citywide. We had over 400 people show up. And we had uh, Andrew McAllister, one of our uh, energy commissioners from the California Energy Commission, come down to give a lecture. And this was the night we were celebrating our achievement of 130 homes. But we've gone way past that now. We're over 400. And so this is where it gets interesting. If you can take a look, we still have a goal of 10%. But we've now done over 400 homes, which means that over the next 25 years, these 400 homes will save over $8 million in utility bills. Rebates received by those homeowners have exceeded $1 million, which have gone into the retrofitting of their buildings. Dollars invested in local real estate is over six million, but based on UCLA and Berkeley studies showing the value of green buildings being sold on the marketplace, this is a low estimate about what we consider the increase in property values are of those four homes, just through energy efficiency retrofit. We've green rated over 160 homes. And we're really, this is, this is the thing that's the most exciting to me. In climates that are continuing to heat up, no matter what we do, increased comfort, durability, air quality matters. It's an increased lifestyle for our communities. As we go into hotter and hotter summers, it's nice to know that our communities are able to put up with that. So dollars and cents, here are a couple projects that have actually, retrofit projects that have actually been completed in Solvang. Santa Maria Solvang area. Um, project number one, they did some air sealing, duct sealing, duct insulation, high efficiency furnace, total cost 12,000, rebates 3,600, and if they financed it, the payments would be $68 a month, oftentimes offset by the energy savings, right? Project number two, a little bit more expensive, air sealing, attic insulation, high efficiency furnace, duct replacement, cost 17, Rebate, $5,600 toward that retrofit, which is increasing the property values, reducing the energy cost, and if they finance that through the Empower loan program, it's $88 a month. So residences in Solvang use approximately 36% 30 of all electricity used in the city, which is surprising. The reason we like Solvang 
number one, because we've started to meet a lot of really great people here. It's a, it's a cohesive community. It's a community with a governing body, a city council, people that could help us get the word out to residences that were going to come in and invest an awful lot of time and money to communicate to people what the opportunities are around energy efficiency. You also have warm summers, cold winters. People are uncomfortable uh, in the summertime. They're looking for things to do. And what we're hoping to do is reduce their overall energy use, which reduces their bills, which reduces their carrying costs on the property that they own, and it frees up disposable personal income that can get put back into the local economy. So it's a wonderful sort of process and project, and we're simply hoping not for really any, you know, economic help, but we would like to be able to be in discussion with you all to see if you have any hesitations about welcoming us in to joint partner with us in terms of an education program to go into communities and talk about the opportunity around energy efficiency and solving. So I wanted to leave a couple minutes for any particular questions you might have. Well, let, let me say this first off, is that I was approached by your organization and I, I found it to be an, an, an intriguing idea. And for my own benefit, uh, it, I, I wanted a, an audit because I just re-roofed re my house, got darker, uh, darker uh, shingles, mm -hmm. and my attic temperature went up. I, I bought an air conditioner and I put out solar power to power the air conditioner. And so I'm interested in what it can do for me. Now I want I want the folks to be aware of that that Creekside was chosen before I was notified. So it's not it's not because I live there. So please understand that. Uh, but but uh, I would encourage you to go forward, and I hope that the rest of the council would also consider that. So if there are any are there any questions? Any questions? Thoughts? Concerns? Yeah. What what type of um, well, you can't take action tonight, but no. You can no, but he can. Yeah. So uh, what's your I first step? Are you the first step? Yeah. We we have been planning and laying a foundation, doing col uh, creating collateral materials, thinking about trying to find a spot to choose. Uh, we've been laying a foundation of other community organizations in the county. For example, our county supervisor Joan Hartman is one thousand percent on board of with what we're doing. Essentially, we would like to be available to address any concerns as soon as possible. And the net result, if, if you are all essentially thumbs up on the idea and you've had time to ask any questions and for us to get back to you, we would simply like you to say, yes, we think this is a good idea. We're willing to have some meetings with you to be trained in what we're going to do. I could do that in an, in an easy workshop in an hour, hour and a half. I'd love the opportunity to explain more of what we're doing. And then for you to basically help us uh, co-market our, our events. We're going to find a, a couple different places in town to gather people. We're going to assign a, uh, probably a couple street, uh, strategic committees that would be uh, located in neighborhoods such as Creekside. I think we'll probably choose two or three communities. We'll ultimately train that group, and then we'll train block champions to go out onto the blocks and actually start knocking on doors, handing out uh, flyers, to just to educate people in terms of what the opportunity looks and feels like. There's absolutely zero pressure here. Um, we do not believe in um, trying to sell anything. Basically, a lot of people don't know that these things are even possible. And so we know that this is a, a series of conversations that we'd like to start in the community. So we're essentially looking for a partnership and a willingness to help us communicate. Yeah. I think the uh, workshop situation would be pretty good because I think uh, you're probably going to go further in depth so we yes. can really understand. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm, um, I'm, I really have no questions right now, but I think um, something like that would be very informative. Great. I would love to do kind of an in-service training if we could organize that at the city level. R the reason I say that is because once we started fanning out in the city, inevitably some homeowner will call the city and the receptionist will pick it up or 
the head of planning will get a phone call and I go, well, what is this thing? And we get hundreds of people coming in from uh, trying to sell me solar and is this, is this legitimate? And so everybody at the city that way would know that it's not only legitimate, but it's backed by the county, it's backed by the utilities and that it's a legitimate program and then you could say something about that to the homeowner and allay any fears right off the bat. So it would be fun to have that. Uh, would, it necessarily, would it necessarily limit the participation to just Solvang City with other neighborhoods or folks, independents within the county? Would they be eligible to participate? That's a great question, actually, yes. What we've learned is that in, in education of this kind, it's best to start with a, a kind of a cohesive neighborhood or city at that level and make sure that everybody, as many as possible, including the organizations, the community organizations, the faith-based organizations, understand what we're doing. And then there's always some kind of collateral bump out that starts happening when we educate, and those people are always welcome in. It's not exclusive at all. We would welcome that, yeah. Any other discussions? Maybe a great idea. Uh, I, I, the workshop idea sounds good. I don't know if the rest of the council wishes to participate, but I'll, if you could put out an invitation at some scheduled time that uh, that we might participate, right. we I, could start. I think we Roy said we point. couldn't take action on it tonight. We're not well, going to. You can't take, take action on it tonight. Um, I, I will tell you that I mean, we do have to pay attention to Brown Act issues. An easy way to do it would be to have a, an official meeting of the city council and have it be a workshop and just this could be an agenda item. Mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't want to have it as an official meeting, uh, then if more than two of you are going to attend, we have to pay attention to other types of rules, but um, people can attend open to the public meetings in other situations. It's just the easiest and cleanest way for staff would be if you decided you wanted a workshop of the city council. I, I, I think that's where I was going with, so I'm nodding my head on this. Mm. Uh, if we had a, a, a workshop prior to a council meeting at one time, like at five o'clock, would that give would that give you enough time to? Uh, That'd an be hour actually to an great. Hour and, an hour and a half would yeah. be great. Oh yeah. So we might want to consider that. Could I could I ask you a question in terms of next steps? Um, we because uh, I'm I'm hearing another city council meeting might be two weeks or four weeks off. Um, we would like to get going sooner, as soon as possible. What would be the easiest way for us to informally move forward before a, some kind of a, um, a resolution or anything else were done, or do we need yeah. to wait for that? Yeah. I, we, we've already looked for nods, and we understand that the council is interested in having um, an agenda item in the future. That's enough direction for staff to begin um, working with them so that we can both make the workshop more effective uh, and make staff's ability to do things after a workshop more effective. So staff already has enough guidance to get to started to informally. Forward. Okay. That, there you go. Sounds great. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you I, I very much for it. all your time. And uh, and I look forward to an audit. <laughs> yes. Okay. Sure You're first in line. <laughs> and I pay full price, by the yeah. way. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Mm. Uh, the city manager's report. Uh, just one thing to report, and that's just to remind everyone in Solvang that uh, Wheels and Windmills will, will be come returning this August, uh, the Saturday, August 26th, and we'll have some road closures uh, in the downtown area for the, uh, the that annual car show. Thank you. Council comments and requ oh, public communications, written or verbal. <laughs> uh -huh. <coughs> we start off with Tracy Beard. Followed by Fred Koval. I think Tracy followed by uh, oh, no. She just stepped out. She's not. The way she is, she thinks she can talk. Tracy Beard. Uh huh. Come on. You get Network. to kick it off. I'm networking. 
Okay, I would like to present, um, and I know this is a no vote for the next meeting, we would like to have a special event application for the Solving Chamber of Commerce for the month of October for a music and art in the park for our residents and for our guests that come to visit us, our tourists. Um, so we have presented um, art and music for the month, October 1st, 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th on a Sunday morning from 10 to 2 and the music from 12 to 2. So this is just a proposal to you. It has to come next time to you for a vote, I think. But I think this is the way we've done it. We have our permit in. The dates are available. We have them just on hold till we meet with you today and see if um, it's something that we can move forward with. Do you have any questions on this? And we want. So um, uh, many years ago, the council adopted a policy for new annual special events that they would come before the city council if they were going to uh, use city facilities. So what we typically do is we ask uh, the sponsor to provide an application, which Tracy has done, and then we bring it before the city council. So yeah, before we get it out of heads, we'll bring it to the next meeting as a pot potential new uh, annual event. So I'm seeing, seeing plenty of nuts. So we're, <laughs> we're good for next meeting. We're not nodding off either. We're just nodding. Okay, plenty of nods. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fred okay, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank okay. you for the cookies. Oh, I, <laughs> don't you think we knew? <laughs> Did you fix it? Did you fix the time event? It's down to two minutes, Fred. Fred Kopel, Solvang. Uh, yeah, I was reading the minutes for ID number one, which is uh, tomorrow. And uh, what they're going to announce is on August the 21st, they were going to they're going to start running water down the river to to cover the A and A and the B and A accounts above Narrows and below Narrows accounts. How long it'll run? No, but huh, you might as well t think about turning on wells three and seven eight while there's water flowing. Uh, tonight, uh, Brian Cheney gave me something very disturbing in the purple folders that uh, I see there's a few up here. And uh, what it starts out with is it, it shows a picture, and apparently this is what's on Hans Deuce's front door, okay? And it's by the sheriff, and it's an eviction notice, which is scary. You know, I'd be scared, too, about this. But then I read the next page, and uh, it says unlawful voting in the city of Solving. And it says it's unlawfully, a city council member unlawfully voting and unlawfully receiving monies from the city. So without going into anything else, uh, the thing that strikes me is the, the bold print. And the bold print says California Code Section 1770. And it says an office becomes vacant on happening at one of the following. And item E is covered here that says he or her ceasing to be an inhabitant of a local uh, residence is required by law. Uh, uh, within the boundaries of his or is required to be discharged immediately. So what I think for Hans to, to sit on the council tonight is to be able to prove that he lives in the city since his eviction notice. And if he can't do that, then he really needs to step down tonight. Because think about I'm trying to think about things that could happen. Are all of his votes noid and, and void since that time? I mean, there's, this is some serious, a serious situation here. I feel for him. I can, uh, I can put my feet in his shoes, but regardless, uh, it's, it's, uh, not, uh, it's not to be happening. And, uh, you know, if I believe everything here, and it looks pretty positive, that um, uh, with other things in here that he needs to resign tonight. 
and also his wife Carla needs to resign from the BAR tonight. So that's my concern, and I'm, you know, I'm very sorry that, you know, I have to say this, but it, it's pretty, it's pretty evident that action needs to be taken tonight. I'll let the uh, city attorney address that question. I'm going to sound like a lawyer. Um, although the code uses the word resident, um, it actually legally means domicile. Uh, domicile, uh, according to the law, is a state of mind, not a location. Uh, this has been litigated many times over the years, and the answer is clear in the law that uh, once you've established a domicile in a place, um, until you change that domicile, you remain domiciled in that place. You only have one domicile. You can have many residences. So um, Mr. Deuce doesn't have to resign, and there's nothing illegal about him continuing to serve and continuing to vote as long as he has a present intention to um, maintain uh, his domicile in solving even if he has to reside someplace else. And I know it sounds lawyerly and goofy, um, but that's the way the law actually works. Is there any, is there any uh, I want to say significant proof other than the desire to remain domiciled, or is there something that's kind of hard and fast that's got to be? Uh, uh, in fact, um, the, the individual um, doesn't have to prove it's domicile. Someone else would have to prove that there, there's, a, would have to prove an intention in somebody else's brain. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so no, and, and in fact, the city council as such has no authority to take any action. Um, nor would anybody on staff. Thank you very much. That's good news to me. Any other comments on this? No. Okay. <clears throat> I have an off. I have. You know, I've have made this excuse a dozen times before, but I have a hard time n with names. And I think it's uh, Minje Micha. Is that you? Would you come up, please? Diorella? Diorelli? Diorelli? Ah, good, thank you. I, I keep making this use. I'm California educated, so I'm not too good at that. Micha Diorelli. So I'm here on behalf of Skip Mesa, um, which is the new development at the top of the hill. And we have created a petition uh, for the city. We, at this point, we have 64 signatures from uh, people in our neighborhood requesting and pleading to the city council to work with us about the issues of speeding and traffic through our neighborhood. We've had many, many, many incidents of children almost getting hit by speedy drivers, um, people getting t almost T-boned, cars coming up on sidewalks. Um, all day long, we're seeing people driving 40, 50, 60 miles an hour through our neighborhood trying to go around the city of Solvang, trying to get to their point B from their point A. Our understanding from the sheriff's department was that our roads were intended to be a way to get around the city. Um, as residents who have bought there in the, over the last three years, we were not informed of that. There is only one stop sign that you have to stop at from the time you enter our neighborhood to the time you exit our neighborhood. And it's causing a lot of fear in a lot of our mother's hearts and father's hearts for our children, especially with school starting this week. And the buses, there is also a deaf child in our neighborhood who has to cross the busy street to the bus stop. So we, are, we have a petition here. We're just asking if we could please work with you to try to put traffic calming measures in place in our neighborhood, whether they are more crosswalks, stop signs, more law enforcement, um, speed humps, not speed bumps, um, <laughs> anything to try to help slow down these drivers through our neighborhood. If it requires us to be put on an agenda for a future meeting to hand you a copy of our petition or to talk about this more, I'm open to whatever the steps are that we can try to move forward with you to get some stripes, stops, 
sirens, whatever is necessary to slow people down. Now, go that to Brad, and uh, so we'll have a, a have it for reference. It. I, I, I'm sympathetic to your problem, and, and I think it really stems from the lack of a traffic signal on Highway 246 that are people are bypassing town, uh, and it also creates a problem on Chalk Hill. Uh, the, the folks leave, leave your subdivision and head down Chalk Hill at high rates of speed that endanger the schools, the children at school, the elementary school. So, and, and he, here our public work director is walking this way. He must have some comments. <laughs> Should I sit down? Thank you. Would you like to comment, Matt? Yes. Uh, good evening, Mayor Richardson, Council Members, Matt Vanderlyn, and your Public Works Director and City Engineer. And I just thought it would be helpful to update you that uh, staff has been working with um, the developer, Coastal uh, Community Builders, and they are in the process of um, hiring a traffic engineer to evaluate the locations of all the existing stop signs uh, in, the, in the neighborhood. They're also going to be doing a speed survey to get some real data on exactly how many cars are traveling through there and what kind of speeds people are driving. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, uh, a couple different alternative locations for adding crosswalks and we're going to be looking at a number of different um, traffic calming measures. So, uh, so the, the study, well like I said, CCB is working with the traffic engineer. I believe they're going to have a, an agreement in place uh, this week and start start working on it this week. I spoke with the traffic engineer to um, communicate the city's concerns. Uh, we've heard from a number of residents up there, so we've taken notes, we've been listening, we, we will continue to listen, and um, we're, we're hearing what they're telling us. Uh, we wanted to make sure the traffic engineer understood all the issues and, and that those would be included in the study. And um, anyway, so, so we're working on it. And uh, sometimes these, these things take a little bit of time. Uh, once we get the study results, we'll be reviewing that. And um, uh, we anticipate uh, coming back with some kind of recommendation to the city council for some type of measures. And uh, then, of course, it would have to be, um, you know, uh, if there was any significant costs, like if we were going to put in, like, mini traffic circles or um, landscaped islands in the middle of the road, uh, we would come back and get approval for any budgetary thing like that. So. Would that traffic study have anything to do with the Caltrans warrants that they're necessary for? For, uh, for, for, the, the, for the traffic signal? Yeah, for the signal. Yeah, no, this is, this is completely totally separate. separate. Yeah. Could it be an input to that to warrant process? Uh, well, the developer is already required to do um, a um, traffic, to update the traffic signal warrant analysis at the end of phase four. So um, that'll be coming here in a few months uh, as well. But, um, but yeah, I think it's uh, more appropriate to handle the two issues separately. Okay. So. Thank you, Matt. That's very good news. Yeah. Good news. Yeah. Did, did you have anything else to say? OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Greg Janke. Followed by Brian Cheney. Hello, Brian Cheney. Uh, my name is Greg Janke. I live at 1226 Pistache, and I don't want to be redundant, but I'm here also to talk about traffic. And it's kind of tough to follow the voice of the mothers of Skip Mesa. <laughs> Mincha did a, did a really good job, but um, we've lived in Solvang, my wife and I, and, and Anne was sitting back here with me uh, about a year. We're not new to the county. We've lived here for 40 years. And um, I was astounded, quite frankly, when we first moved on to Skid Mesa. Uh, I live on the corner of Pistache and Solvang Mesa. But I, I, I'm standing out watching the, the procession go by, and it reminds me of a NASCAR truck race. You know, um, in fact, I was in jest going to get a welcome race fan sign and stick it out in my front yard because that pretty adequately describes it. Well, one day I was, I was out in the front yard about two weeks ago, and I noticed a set of skid marks that went down Solvang Mesa across the limit line on Pistache and into my neighbor's front yard. And I thought, this is interesting. It was about 60, 65 feet of locked wheel skids. And I, I was a cop for 30 years, so that computes into, you know, a pretty good speed. Um, so I threw something up on our Facebook page, you know, about, hey, you know, what do you guys think about 
traffic in the neighborhood. You know, we'll have a meeting last Wednesday or a week ago Wednesday. I had 60 people squeezed into my little um, living room of my house, and tensions are running very high. People are really upset. Um, We've watched the deterioration of the quality of life, both in terms of speed, uh, literal about 30, 40, 50 percent of the cars don't even bother to slow down or stop for the stop signs. Uh, noise, lots of noise. Uh, it's very unsafe for, for people riding bikes through the neighborhood and trying to walk with their kids. We have a lot of moms pushing strollers through there and, uh, uh, you know, uh, like I said, at the risk of not wanting to be redundant, uh, it's it's pretty dangerous and I'm glad to have the opportunity to work with Matt, with Sean O'Grady from the Sheriff's Department, uh, talk to a couple of council members about this and, um, you know, we are anxious to do whatever we can do as residents to, to try to mitigate some of this situation. Um, I would also ask that, you know, given my law enforcement background, I look at a city like this as plagued with the, the volume of traffic that it has and uh, complaints about traffic is not unique to Skid Mesa, but I would certainly urge the council and the city to look favorably upon some augmentation of the police budget to incre uh, include perhaps uh, increased traffic enforcement either in the form of a motor officer or some kind of additional hours per week or something, just something out there that uh, we can use to slow traffic down in town because it's uh, certainly not what our, our Danish founding fathers had in mind when they laid out the dairy farms of Solvang, that it would that they it would turn into what it's turned into, but we're victims, I guess, of our own success. So, anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I'm certainly available for any questions. We're available to talk to anybody on staff uh, as to the spokespeople for the the concerned residents of Skid Mesa. Well, okay. thank you, Craig. Thank you, and I'm really, I'm really encouraged by the fact that you you have a neighborhood group that gets together and discusses these things to make action. One voice helps, but a whole crowd of them really as well. Well, and you can see the city is right, good, making an effort to, to correct that situation. Yeah, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you for that. <coughs> Brian Cheney. Before you go, I'd like to... Mayor, City Council. Um, 15, 20 years ago, I stood up here addressing the same problem on Viborg. Um, the uh, wisdom of the City Council at that time was to do a speed study. They had little bumpers out there for a month. And they found out that the cars were going 42 miles an hour average. So the wisdom was instead of going 25 through a neighborhood, they went 42. So they raised it to 30. So now they actually go in 60. So don't get your hopes up. <laughs> and that's still the problem today. Um, San Luis Reservoir Report. Uh, it's dropped down six feet since the last meeting. Uh, we're 11 feet down from spill. Um, next question was well 22. We got all the bids in on well 22, and how many did we get? I, I, I think it caught it me It just closed, guard. correct? According to the website. Okay. Um, and did you get permission from the County of Santa Barbara to do the work? That's the second question, because they've owned it since 1979. And you can't do anything until they've agreed to it. Owned what? They own the property where Well 22 is. You're not aware of that? That's, uh, that's, that's the city park, right? No. No. Oh, 22 over on, on uh, re Rebuild. Santa Barbara County owns that. Yeah, so I, I've, we I've, have worked, I've worked out of the creek well before. It was we, we have 6% off, 6 feet off the roadway yeah. is the city limits, yes. But but where the well and the yeah building that's out that's outside that six foot exactly yes, correct so you'll need to do that that's it thank you thank you Brian Matt uh, I just thought it'd be helpful again to update you so um, uh, the project has gone out to bid we received three bids and we're in the process of uh, evaluating the bids and uh, we'll be bringing that back to city council for your, um, with a recommendation to award a contract, a construction contract uh, here in September. And um, that, that area is all with, within the Solvang city limits. The parcel is owned by Santa Barbara County Flood Control District. And uh, the 
the county provided the city permission many years ago, 20 years ago. The well was the well was drilled, cased, uh, PG&E transfer was in, installed, a city electric meter was installed, which we've been paying on that, you know, for all these years, uh, as well as electrical panels and some minor piping was installed, and a uh, small um, railroad tie, uh, little retaining wall. So the city has been utilizing that facility. Received county permission to construct the facility and, and utilize it. Uh, it's it's our opinion that um, we really don't need their permission to to upgrade the well, uh, but we are working with them and um, just to uh, address any concerns they have. And we're not planning to begin construction until we have resolved that. Thank you for that, Matt. You're full of good news tonight. <laughs> Thank you. I have no other speaker slip for a public comment period. Does anybody else wish to speak at this time? Uh, seeing none, we'll, break, we'll go on to the next uh, item on the agenda, which is comment, uh, council comments and requests. Would you like to start, Ms. Jamison? Okay, um, one, a couple of these are tag-ons to some correspondence we received from the chamber, so I'm going to wait until that comes up. Um, I attended two very nice chamber functions. One was the San Inez Chamber out at uh, the casino, and Sam Cohen hosted that. He's a new member of the San Inez uh, Chamber. And then we had a great barbecue out at the park. It was kind of in thanking the members, I guess, of the chamber. Um, and Tracy did a great job with that. Food was good. Um, Life's good. A lot of people in town. <laughs> That's good, as long as they shop. I encourage them all to shop. Hands, Mr. Dukes. Um, yeah, I went to the, um, the chamber function down at the park. Great job, Tracy. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, yes, I got evicted. And I had a lot of help getting out. And, and there are people that I really am very grateful for in this city and in this valley who, who really stepped up. And no, you're not getting rid of me this easy. Mr. Tucson? <laughs> I guess my only comment was about uh, the traffic. It just seems like we're getting lots of complaints from all different areas and solving is there is there anything we can do to better manage traffic to reduce the uh, the angry drivers flying down the roads on the, the residents they're just going faster it's going faster <laughs> handled it. I, I, don't, I don't know if, if Matt has any possible solutions or some study we need to do or Well, you're not going to like the answer. Uh, we spent three years working with the city council to address um, concerns about pedestrian safety on Mission Drive. And um, we are in the process of getting an encroacher permit right now to do, um, I think, about $400,000 of um, crosswalk and safety improvements on Mission Drive, which will only further uh, reduce the flow of traffic there. Uh, that's not really the intent to slow down traffic. The intent is to try to um, maintain the flow as best we can while improving the safety of the pedestrians. But um, we had many, many near misses, and then just in the last uh, year and a half, we had actually two uh, pedestrians that got hit uh, by vehicles. So, um, I, and again, that was a process that we went through, looked at multiple different types of um, improvements to Mission Drive, including uh, eliminating the um, median and having a single double yellow stripe, eliminating the parking and having bike lanes with two lanes of traffic in both directions. So we looked at a whole myriad of, um, of possible uh, configurations for striping and, and dealing with traffic, like I said, including eliminating all parking and um, having four lanes of, uh, there. Uh, so there's a wide variety of things looked at. <coughs> we had multiple workshops. Um, we, uh, 
took uh, surveys at those workshops um, uh, from the community. And uh, so the city council decided on, um, I think it's three or four top priority uh, sets of improvements. Um, the first two were being implemented together. So we're doing minor uh, intersection improvements um, at, th at the three main uh, signalized intersections. And um, so those cross streets right now, like Fifth and Adderdag and um, Alisal, well, this mo mainly applies to Fifth and Adderdag. Uh, we are going to be striping those cross streets to have designated um, through lane and uh, left turn lane. Right now, there's no um, there's no separation of the of the vehicles. They all just you know back up. Uh, but we're going to be striping that so that there's a designated left turn lane and a designated through lane, uh, through and right right turn lane. So um, so th that that's what we currently have. Um, if we can think about heading southbound on Alisal uh, to Mission, we've got that um, separation there with the designated left turn and the, and the uh, through and right, right turn. So um, we'll have that same um, configuration at the other intersections. So that should help a little bit of the congestion on the side streets. But um, uh, yeah, so that's, I know that's not, um, probably not what you wanted to hear, but uh, so long story short, some minor improvements at the intersections, crosswalk improvements, all these are as directed by city council uh, after, again, multiple studies and workshops and things, so. Can I get a copy of those project plans? The Mission Drive plans? Mission oh yeah, the city council has approved all those, we can get you those. But uh, just to follow up, I think your question was more citywide on the traffic, yeah. So um, I'll tell you what the, every public works director has ever told any council typically is enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. That's the only way you really deal with most of the speed and those types of things. Unfortunately, our contract for uh, law enforcement has one deputy 24-7. That's what we pay for. So if we use our deputy can just on traffic issues, he's not available for the rest of the, the things that go on and within the city. So there, the other option would be essentially to pay overtime to have a deputy come in so you have two on duty, one of them's doing traffic control more often than, than we could. So that would be one potential solution in those areas that people are complaining. Um, we are also looking at uh, a speed, automatic speed sign up on Chalk Hill coming southbound on that, um, just past the cemetery as a potential option to, like, like we have on Viborg. Um, it, similar to something like that. It doesn't give you any enforcement, but it reminds people that they're speeding. So um, we could definitely bring back an estimated budget uh, if you'd like to pursue uh, additional law enforcement on an overtime basis to do traffic control within the city, but it would be an addition to our contract that we have with the Sheriff's Department. You're, you're taking all my comments away. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to just add. I, I, I guess the way I see it is if, if everything's all buckled up on 246, that's when everyone starts sprawling out and, you know, the, the rage has already set in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman. Oh, I'm, I was just gonna oh, say oh, I'm that sorry. Go the ahead. staff has no intention of uh, raising any speed limits at any time in the near future, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but that, yeah. that, that, that leads you to a problem because um, the, the, the city council, is, as it continues to think about these issues, you have to understand that you're gonna be hampered by, by state law. Uh, and um, there's two just glaring examples of where it gets very frustrating. Uh, one is stop signs. Uh, literally, uh, if, if you put in a stop sign where in the engineering concept it's not warranted, you, the, the theory is that you, you have actually done harm to traffic instead of helping it, so you become liable for accidents, et cetera. Uh, and so you have to be very careful about where you put stop signs. Uh, when it comes to speed, we have to remember that um, there's a, a very big preference to using radar for speed enforcement. And, and there's a good reason for that, especially in residential zones, because if you can't use radar, then what has to happen is the officer has to clock the speeding vehicle. So instead of one speeding vehicle going through a residential neighborhood, you have two because the officer has to speed in order to clock the speeder. Uh, and in addition to that, 
most people don't accelerate to try and get away from radar, but some people do accelerate to try and get away from the officer. And so you run into the situation where if you put the officer in the position of having to clock, you sometimes make the speeding problem and the safety problem worse. So most jurisdictions cho choose to want to be able to use radar enforcement. Well, that's where you get the last wrinkle, and that's what ended up with the problem with the speed going up. Uh, in order to legally use radar, you have to have speed surveys, and you have to set the speed limit within a specified distance from those speed surveys. So that's what happens. If you do a speed survey where you didn't have one before so that you can use radar to enforce it, then that may tell you that you can't have a 25 mile an hour zone. You have to have a 30 mile an hour zone or even a 35 mile an hour zone. Th I'm not mentioning some other wrinkles about in some places you can back it back down, but that's the problem. You, you can't use common sense to set speed limits. Uh, and so it's a very frustrating process and that's why most of your public works directors will continually recommend enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. Uh, and then I have to tell you, everyone loves enforcement until they or their cousin get a ticket. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you've had your opportunity, Brian. Uh, and, and I think, I th if I remember correctly, the time of that speed uh, survey with the radars, I think that the city council warned that the potential for increasing the speed limit in that neighborhood was very was very real uh, because of the speech of that. And it seems to me that they had to round it to five miles plus or minus of the actual speed that was, uh, was, was meant it, was noted, so. And that's what happened. Mr. Zimmerman. My only comment is um, nothing gets by Fred, does it? <laughs> we gotta make sure we get out in front of that, anything. Um, but interesting, uh, Roy, just uh, on the on the domicile, um, just because it's on my head, just thinking about it. Um, so that's like the state of mind in which are the best interest of, or uh, what what exactly? No, the state of mind. In other words, e each individual um, has their state of mind as as to what their domicile is, and I, I usually because I'm left of Bernie Sanders, I use George. H.W. Bush is my example because he was domiciled in Texas. He lived in Connecticut, but he was domiciled in Texas and he did go down to Texas and stay in a hotel room when he was gonna vote in Texas. But his domicile was in Texas because that's where he, in his mind he was domiciled. And so his residence for Texas purposes was this hotel room that other people stayed in all the time too and he had another residence, but many people can have way more than just two residences. So it doesn't really matter the distance, like no. San Inez versus say Santa Barbara or no. something like this, okay. Um, and then if someone were to contest it, who would be someone that would argue that or try and? Uh, they, they would have to go to the Attorney General and seek permission to sue in quo warranto to try and uh, have a council member removed. Okay. Thing. Thank you. Yeah. It's interesting. Thank you. Uh, my, my comments were the San Inez Chamber uh, of Commerce accepted uh, our application, but they recorded it as the City of Solvang. And uh, it wasn't meant to be an official City of Solvang membership. Uh, so I'm just wanting you to be aware of that. So uh, unless, unless the council wants it to be, but in, uh, uh, it's been registered that way and it shouldn't have been. It should have been a couple of council papers, not you know, so just so just be aware of that this that the uh, the membership in the solving in the San Inez Chamber of Commerce is not an official City of Solvang membership. Number two. But the city can join if they want to. Yeah, the city city members city can, can join. join yeah, sure. We can't. Yeah, well, we're a member of the Solvang Chamber of Commerce. Right. So we could join the San Inez. If, well, if actually, the council uh, to encourage membership in in uh, in chambers, uh, if one belongs to the Chamber of Commerce in Buellton, the Chamber of Commerce in uh, solving, they can join the Chamber of Commerce, any other Chamber of Commerce in the Valley, uh, they get a $25 discount on their application. That's <laughs> what, that's what drug me in, so. <laughs> and, and if you belong to the uh, Santa Inez Chamber and the Buellton Chamber, the Solvang Chamber will give you a $25 discount, so. 
Uh, the other thing I have here is the Santa Maria Valley Humane Society is having a picnic on the lawn on, on September the 10th uh, to, uh, to, uh, to help the, the Humane Society, and that'll be in Santa Maria. Uh, and it's $12.50 a ticket, and it's, to, it's, for, uh, it's for the saving our dogs and cats. Important. Uh, then uh, Brad, uh, Brad already mentioned the uh, car show that's coming up. And then, and then uh, I have a note on speeding on Chalk Hill I'm concerned about, and also speeding on Pine Street. We've had complaints from folks that reside on Pine Street that, that since Maple has gone through that there's people are speeding up uh, Pine at uh, higher rates of than the 25 miles an hour speed zone. Unintended con un we call that unintended consequences. Yes. And, but the, we've had the motor officer up there and, uh, and the sheriff has, has witnessed that and they can't see much evidence of speeding. There aren't, the traffic is not that heavy and we're catching it the wrong time of day, but there's gonna be some follow up on that. Could be. Oh, I, I guarantee it. I could be blindfolded and I could tell you what day of the week it is. <laughs> guarantee. Okay. Th thank you, Brian. Yes, sir. And then, uh, and then uh, we were talking about this added traffic enforcement uh, for the city. Is it? Could you uh, do a survey or a study or uh, or get some pricing on what it might cost us to bring a motor officer in or to to add another sheriff's deputy to this force or like you said the overtime thing so we can make a decision as to which way we want to go yeah if there's enough head nods we can bring an item back for options as to what you might want to do okay thank you do I, have <laughs> <laughs> I got a if note <laughs> I, just, I have a feeling if they want to get reelected they'll shake their head yes <laughs> 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 because if there is a strong neighborhood contingent uh, up there uh, Next is uh, correspondence received by City Council, and I think Ms. Jameson had some comments. Well, there is, I think you should make a uh, note of the letter that was received. Well, we have a letter from uh, Elroy Museum thanking us for their grant, and we have a letter from the Solvang Chamber and Visitors Bureau about relocating a, uh, a parking uh, area for the buses to uh, parking lot four and also a comment from the Solvang Chamber of Commerce of the same subject. Okay, so there's the bus comment, and then there's, I've, it seems like every store I walked into <laughs> in the last two weeks, p the merchants have been complaining about the dirty sidewalks, and then I've been told by Matt and by Brad that they have, they are being cleaned, but I think they need a super duper cleaning because they have not been cleaned for so long. The stains are really bad, and I think something needs to happen. Um, it's embarrassing. It, it's, a, it's a cleaning been this ste steam cleaning or just sweeping? It's been steam cleaning, and I'm told they've been doing extra because of that. that, that we don't get as much distance because we're taking more time on trying to get the probably year and a half worth of dirt off of the, the sidewalks. So we are trying that, but it. it one one spilt soda later, uh, it looks like you were never there. So it, have, have we uh, gotten a bid ever, uh, like for a service to come in and do it? Like it is a private oh, service that does it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. We also own one. The city has one, and we'll do some spot cleaning with that one also. Okay. Okay, and then another complaint that I've had from merchants is the fact that when they come and pick up the trash, I have no idea when trash is picked up within this downtown area but the person that's picking up the trash blocks people in their parking places. And it's not like he just stops there and gets one waste and empties it. He does the whole street in his tr truck or whatever he's using is stopped there and it blocks people in. So, and that has been witnessed by a number of shopkeepers. Yeah, Matt put a notice out to his guys to not okay. do that, so. Okay, and, and another comment on the cleaning of the sidewalks there. There are some merchants that are cleaning their own sidewalks, and that's defeating the purpose of conservation. So if we're not going to take care of it, they've taken it upon themselves to take care of it. So I think we need to step up and do a better, step up and do a better job. It's my opinion. I don't know how anybody else feels about it. Well, well I agree with you 100 percent. You know, especially and with cigarette butts. Oh, the cigarette butts. That's, that's another thing that I have. <laughs> There are cigarette butts all over this community, and if you watch the ad on television about stuff that goes in the storm drain, and one of the worst things that can go in the storm drain is our cigarette butts. Hey, we need to have a place, a receptacle or something for those people. Around the post office, it's atrocious. It's awful. 
So, and I know that there are other places in the community that are bad too. So we need to have, it, people from other countries tend to smoke a lot. So we need to have a place for them to put their butts, please. Is, is the, are the garbage cans emptied on a daily basis? Uh, yes, the early morning and then I believe on the heavier days twice w a day. Would it be possible for the person that empties those to carry a broom and a, and a, and a uh, dustpan and kind of <laughs> sweep around the area for cigarette butts? No, this is a, that won't help. It's all over the place. They just they drop them in the gutter. They drop them on the sidewalk. It's like you can you can map a trail where these people have been. It's not a good example. Then we need to encourage more ashtrays. Huh? Yeah, I think I think at that last council meeting brought up this comment, and Matt yes. uh, has his maintenance supervisor looking at those potential sites for adding those. Uh, yeah, those things on the butt trash. collectors. Yes. I think they're called. Yeah. <laughs> You had, <laughs> you had your opportunity, Fred. <laughs> I, w I would like to um, address the um, the bus parking, uh, the the uh, letters. I think it's I think it's a good idea to utilize other parking lots, uh, but I wouldn't do it at the expense a hundred percent of um, the um, be behind um, over by the mission. Because um, there, there, there are a lot of businesses in there that really rely on that. So I'm, I'm hoping what the the intent is is to spread the wealth a little bit. Okay, I see the head head nod. So I'm, I'm happy with that. I thought I thought a good suggestion was to drop off by behind the mission and a pickup in parking lot four and have the tour guide know the direction so they can herd the folks in that direction so they don't have so they have a chance to see the whole town and not halfway down and halfway back to the buses. I'm told they have enough trouble finding out, finding the spot they got dropped off, so <laughs> to switch that would be probably dangerous, is what Tracy has told me. <clears throat> the, the thought is there. So what, are we gonna, so what are we gonna do about the buses? I mean, they wrote two really pretty strong letters, and we're just kind of glossing over it. What are we gonna do? Are we gonna do anything? Or are we just gonna leave it status quo? Well, let's, uh, let's consider bringing it back as an agenda. So, yes, yeah, so we don't control the buses. We can definitely make a lot for available, but we don't have any contact with the tour bus operators. The the tour, and the tour buses actually pro park on private property. Yes, because the benefit of the business is adjacent yes. to those. And yes. they are catered to. Mm -hmm. so, that's so there is a, a true impact if you were to move them right. from that site. So yeah, and the buses are free there. So you're, what you would do is you give up public parking. Uh, we can come back with an item to look at some kind of layout for bus parking in lot four if that's what you want to do we can definitely do that like i said we can't really get we don't we don't contact or have connections with the bus companies so but do you want an item back for yeah, well, i'd like uh, to bring it up reconfiguring okay i think it's a good idea All right. any other comments on the on the correspondence received with that we go on to uh, approval of the agenda as presented does anybody want to change the agenda Seeing none, we'll go on to the uh, City Council minutes of July 24th. Uh, is there any additions, corrections, or deletions to that uh, agenda? And if not, can I have a, a motion? I'll, make, I'll got, make the motion to uh, <laughs> accept. Suddenly got no. Okay, it's been moved. Any seconds? I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Pass. Okay, on to the consent agenda. Does anybody wish to pull any consent agenda items? I just make the wish to make a comment. I asked a series of questions, and I really appreciated the promptness of the answers. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on it? With that, uh, can I have can I have a motion accepting the uh, consent agenda? I so move. Is there a second? A second. It's been moved and seconded. Me to call the roll, please. Councilmember Jamison? Yes. Deuce? Yes. Tucson? Yes. Zimmerman? Yes. Mayor Richardson? Uh, yes. And that passes with a 5 0. On to the regular agenda, item number seven. Item seven, extension of cannabis marijuana regulations. Staff report. 
Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'll be giving the staff report this evening. Uh, this comes before you on my recommendation to extend the urgency ordinance. Um, basically, the urgency ordinance just puts a freeze on uh, any um, wholesale or retail um, commercial distribution of recreational uh, marijuana. I know a lot of people don't want me to use recreational, but you know, that's to me, it's the only way to make sure everyone understands what we're talking about as opposed to the medicinal. Uh, the, I think there's some very good reasons to continue uh, the ban and the, the moratorium for the one more year that's allowed. Number one uh, is that the state still has not uh, even released um, the proposed regulations uh, on on businesses. And we will when we're looking when we do look at it uh, for solving, it's going to be a planning issue. In other words, although you will have the legal power to permanently ban uh, recreational marijuana uses, meaning as business uses or property uses, not people growing their own or smoking it, um, if you don't want to permanently ban it, you're going to want to decide where are the best locations in Solfang to allow, for instance, a, a retail business. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, an industrial commercial processing plant. Uh, there aren't many good locations anyway, but you're going to want to think about all those things. I don't know how um, your staff can competently make recommendations to the Planning Commission and to you on where to locate businesses and what types of regulations we should consider imposing in addition to the state when we don't know what the state's regulations are and what they're going to leave open to us. Uh, I also um, have noticed, uh, as we pay attention to these issues all the time, uh, that n nobody in California, um, except for places like Oakland that, that had tas taxes passed many years ago, uh, is making a killing on funds for the city as such. In other words, it's not a big tax boom. The, or the state law that passed established a 15% excise tax that all goes to the state. And you're going to want to consider um, one of the reasons for not having a ban altogether is that in the future, cities that completely ban uh, a retail outlet for recreational marijuana are not going to get grants from the excise funds. Um, but that's a decision you can make in the future. But that also means that the availability for it to be a revenue source to the city as such uh, isn't going to be that great. You'll also want to hear what recommendations the sheriff's office has. I mean, you don't have to do what the sheriff's office tells you anymore and you have to do what I tell you. We just make recommendations. But they're going to want, want to make some recommendations. And for instance, I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate. It, it may be that uh, the sheriff's office would study it and think that if you did impose your local tax, that's going to raise the tax so high that everything goes black market anyway making it a worse enforcement problem for the sheriff. I'm just making this up. I'm not speaking for the sheriff. But what I'm saying is there's lots of information you're going to want to hear to make intelligent decisions. And the staff you're going to have to rely on doesn't have enough information from the state to be able to make good recommendations to you. So that's why I've recommended that we and continue the ban for the one more year we're allowed to <coughs> and give your staff a chance to bring it back in a good fashion. The state has promised to have the proposed regulations out in the fall. So it should give us enough time to actually deal with it. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions of the staff report? Seeing none, then we'll go to the public for comment. I have uh, one, one public comment, Fred Coble. Fred Coble, solving resident. I think it's a tragedy what the state has imposed on us. I'm so worried about the kids. They're going to be exposed solving elementary school right off the bat. And it just is not a win-win for the city. The city goes out and tries to open up some dispensaries. What does that say to the families, the families that have kids? Do I have any part of this? No. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a shame.
that where this is going to go to. I mean, you know, how many people are you to take advantage of six plants? A lot of people in the city are going to take advantage of that. To condone it is, is even worse. To extend it for one year is a, is a no-brainer. The question is, what are you going to do from that? Better start really thinking about that very carefully. Where do you want to be? How do you want, how do you want to treat this city? What's going to be the reputation for tourism? Hey, we can go and have fun. And we can also buy a stog. Is that the way you want this city to go in that direction? I don't think so. Thank you, Fred. Is there anyone else with wish to make a comment at this time? Seeing them, we'll bring it back to the council for uh, action. Uh, who'd like to start? I, I will. I guess I have a different perspective on it, and I think that it's all perception based. And uh, if we continue to put the pail up, it's just going to be more intriguing for the youth to want to try it, and uh, you know, it, it creates, uh, I think. Uh, a pent up, you know, desire. The rest of the world, the rest of the California can can do it, and it's legal here in California, but not in Solving. Um, it might ac might actually have <coughs> the reverse effect. Um, I had something else I wanted to say about it, but I can't remember now. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, uh, with the tax uh, taxing, I think how they're getting around that is uh, it's a license so it's a high fee so you can charge like a quarter million dollars for an annual license and it'll probably curtail anybody from doing it potentially or minimizing the impact while collecting a guaranteed uh, you know set rate or whatever Just something to think about um, yeah that's all are there any other comments yes until um, the state comes through with um, what they're going to do, we, should, we can't do anything. We can be thinking about it, but um, um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. We, uh, we, we, kick, we kick the can down, another, down the street for another year uh, because we can't make a decision because we have no idea what the state's going to do. Ms. Jameson? Um, I was talking uh, with the planner up in the Santa Maria office about um, the ordinance that the county is considering. And um, she advised me to look up uh, what Grover Beach has done, and they've done quite a, quite a bit of work, but yet they're having some difficulties with what they have approved already. And, the, and like uh, Neil said, they have large fees to license any establishment. They have certain areas where they can be located. Um, I don't know that we want a real commercial, big commercial plant in Solvang. I don't know if that's going to work either. Uh, but I'm for kicking it, the can down the road another few miles until we find out what the state is going to say. And that being said, I'm not sure that we can just put our head in the sand I lived in on the North Shore of uh, outside of Chicago, and that was a dry area even when I was there. And there was one little town, Homewood, where you could go buy your alcohol. And it was an amazing place. They were very wealthy, very wealthy. But let's kick it down. The, the um, Grover City went to way, way, way out there to study this process. And I would advise you all to go online and, and take a look at it. It's very interesting. They, their EIR was very thorough. Um, it's unfortunately, I think it's coming. Mr. Tucson, any comments? No. Uh, if that's the motion, I'll uh, I'll second it. Well, I, 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 I want to agree. I agree with the, the idea of extending the the uh, the ordinance because, like like we were, like it was said, is that. Uh, we don't know what the state's going to do, and we don't want to go counter to the state, so I believe that we should uh, extend the ordinance. I'd just like to make one more comment, if I might. Sure. Um, 
I'm really interested in how what the sheriff is going to have to say about what's going to happen um, because they can't put their money in a bank. It's it's a huge invitation to people to come and rob these places. Um, it's going to be a nightmare. It's very it has not been thought out very well at all. And shame on us all, all whoever the seventy percent who voted for it. Mr. Tucson, would you like to make the motion? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll make the motion to uh, to extend the uh, what was it emergency ordinance. Is there a second? I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. Would you call the roll, please? Councilmember Tucson. Yes. Jameson. Yes. Deuce. Yes. Zimmerman. Yes. Mayor Richardson. Oh uh, yes, and that passes with a five zero. On to item uh, eight. Item eight: stormwater program funding. Uh, good evening again, Mayor report? Richardson and council members. Uh, I just wanted to uh, introduce our associate engineer, Bridget Elliott, um, she's right here. She'll be uh, uh, presenting the staff report this evening. And I uh, just wanted to make a few comments. Uh, Bridget is an outstanding engineer. She is, um, uh, she has over 10 years of experience. She's a registered civil engineer here in the state of California and actually elsewhere. And um, Bridget, one of uh, Bridget's primary uh, responsibilities is to manage the city's stormwater management, or to administer the city's stormwater management program. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bridget. And we'll both be available for questions. Thanks, Matt. This is your first time. Don't be nervous. Okay, I won't <laughs> be nervous. Um, the Federal Clean Water Act requires that the city of Solvay operate a stormwater permit um, for the discharge of the storm wa stormwater from the city stormwater system to the surface water. That includes uh, the creeks and, and the river, the San Inez River. Under that permit, we're required to have um, several elements that uh, we manage in that permit, including our municipal operations, the development design, construction of um, projects, enforcement, education, monitoring, in addition to that, the state has implemented the trash amendment and added that in addition to what we already do in our permit. The trash amendment um, will hopefully take care of those cig cigarette butts because we're not allowed to release any trash um, above five millimeters into uh, the river and the creeks. So these regulations, um, and uh, there's more to come with the TMDL of the San Inez River, have caused, uh, have caused our cost to increase for the stormwater program. In the fiscal year budget 17-18, uh, we have over $550,000 allocated to our stormwater program. And over the next five years, that will continue to increase because um, as we implement these other regulations. Um, currently, our city has one drainage impact fee, and that drainage impact fee is $100 for a resident or $500 per acre for a commercial project. Last year, um, this, well, this spring, the city had Bartle Wells do a, a study to evaluate our stormwater program and um, make some recommendations on what we could do to um, implement fees. And um, in their study, they outlined uh, four different ways that we could um, generate funds for the program. One would be using going through Proposition 218. Um, the second one would be increasing impact fees. The third one would be reallocating funds for s water and sewer to our storm drain um, funds. And then the fourth one would be through grants. And um, as you know, the state of California grants, the grant application process is hyper competitive. And because we're um, not a disadvantaged community, our chances are limited in that area. When it comes to reallocating funds from the water and sewer, we have to make a direct connection between the stormwater and the water and sewer. 
um, so that we have to show a beneficial use between the two. And the way our system is set up, it, that's unlikely. So BWA recommended that we do two things. We use the property related fee element of um, Prop 218 and we do a, um, we increase our development fees for stormwater. In order to do the, um, the Proposition 218, the property related fees, it would require a rate study, public hearing, from at that public hearing if we had a 50% majority say yes, put it on the ballot, then we send that pal ballot out to the property owners. And if we have a majority yes to that, yes, we'd like more fees, yes, we'd like more taxes, then we're set. We have a, <laughs> you know, we have our fees. We have our mechanism to fund these, re these regulations. So as you can see, it's going to be difficult to do that. And um, some people in the legislature have recognized that. There is currently a, um, a bill, 231, that is trying to broaden um, the definition of sewer in Proposition 218. Right now, um, Proposition 218 allows water, sewer, and trash to be exempt from the voting requirements. And with um, stormwater being included in that definition, then that would alleviate that requirement and we would be able to fund it similar to how we fund water, sewer, and trash collection right now. The, the bill itself has gained a lot of momentum, and, um, but it has, been this, it has been tried before. In 2002, um, the state appeal court ruled that sewer did not include stormwater, but that was 15 years ago, and um, w I think we recognize water, sewer, and storm drain are all under the water umbrella as a resource, and so maybe there's a chance that that might pass this time. Um, currently, the city doesn't have any mechanism to fund with the exception of our development impact fee. Um, right now, we're funding through the, the general fund for all of these expenditures, and so this report um, and our uh, recommendation today is that we at least update our development impact fee. We get approval from the council to do that and um, then we'd like your direction on how we should proceed if um, you would like us to move forward with um, Bartle Wells recommendations or if you would like to wait and see what happens um, with SB 231. That's it. Questions? Are there any questions of the staff report? What's our development impact fee now? It's um, $100 per acre for a residential, um, $100 per acre, f acre for parks, open space type situations, and $500 per acre for uh, commercial, industrial, retail. And that, those impact fees are for new construction. Yes. So we charged Mercantile $500. Any other questions, staff report? Thank you, Bridget. You've done well. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, speaker slips from uh, Fred Colville. Fred, go to the public. Good evening, City Council members. Cost of living is going to go up, isn't it? Well, I took a look at the suggested approach, and I did some math. And this has to do with your roof and the concrete around your house. How much is there? Because that's what's going to have to be drained away. And uh, based on what I saw, and knowing the square footage of my concrete in the front and the back and the roof, my fee would be $1,000 a year.
plain and simple. That's what it's all about. So, another fee, another way of life. How do we reduce that impact? What are the ways that we can stop this from occurring? An unfunded mandate placed on the backs of the ratepayers. Remember I pay two water bills? I pay three water bills, in fact. Can't drink the water, just like the staff buys water. I know I saw it in the Warrens. Because they can't drink the water, or they don't want to drink the water the city provides. I pay a parcel tax, ID number one's parcel tax, because we're inside their boundaries. And then I pay my water sewer bill. Does anybody ever add that all up and see what it cost a person to live in this city? There's got to be a better way of conducting business. We cannot afford the way the city operates today. We cannot afford to be in business as a city with paid employees. Should I bring out my chart? My, my graph, I got it. I'm ready to put a date on it when this city goes bankrupt. Not too far in the distant future. I'm pretty well honed in on it, and I'll be presenting it in the near future. Thank you, Fred. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? I have no other speaker slips. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council for discussion. Would anybody like to start? Mr. Zimmerman? Um, if we collected the water, uh, sent it to the wastewater treatment facility, treated the water, and then used it as gray water, would that tie it to the wastewater and water uh, fund? Yes, yeah, that would be a beneficial use of the stormwater. Okay. Would we have to tie the sewer system to the, to the, I mean, the, the stormwater system, street system, to the sewer system for it to be accepted? Would it be a, I mean, would the plumbing, we have to connect the plumbing between the two? Yeah. Doesn't it all? You also have to have a way of storing the mass amount of water that's going to come to you. In a, in a rainstorm. Storm. Yeah, it's call, that's called a combined system. They're popular in the Midwest or were. Um, the problem is in a big storm event, you, you don't have the capacity. Your plant can't process it. So, um, one of the uh, one of the examples that um, BWA gave in their in their report for the funding in in that area for the enterprise water sewer enterprise fund was reimbursing stormwater for any shared assets between stormwater and water slash wastewater. So. I mean, yeah, potentially that would be fit. It doesn't have to be every single drop. I mean, even if we had somewhat of a capture and clean rate, maybe. Just thought I would add um, uh, that stormwater capture is actually part of our permit uh, for any new development. They're required to um, have facilities to infiltrate the, the water and capture it and filter it. So, um, but that's just any new development or significant redevelopment. So that would be really slow, slowly happening over the years. But um, the problem with trying to try, the, trying to tie the storm drain facilities into the wastewater treatment plant is this: if you saw the price tag, you fall out of your chair. It's just astronomically expensive because of all the infrastructure you'd need to. Doesn't it just go, I mean, I followed it right to the river. I mean, why can't we just put a thing at the end of the river, right there where it dumps into the river? How hard is that? Just leave it alone and just collect it at the river. Uh, well, <laughs> for starters, to, to get something like that permitted, um, you know, they, they don't really, well, I'm not exactly sure uh, what you're describing, but um, if that facility was going to be within the bank of the river, you know, that permitting would be um, pretty much impossible. But uh, if you... If well, no, just the, like to get it across the river, you know, like a pipe maybe? 
Yeah, yeah. There's there's ways there's ways that what you're describing can be done. F physically, it's it's possible. Uh, it's just the the cost is huge. Depend, you know, depending on exactly what you do, but. Mr. Tuzuk, any comments? Um, well, I guess I, I'm, I'm definitely very sensitive to the additional, what, $1,000? Uh, is it an acre or what's the? Oh, parcel. Okay. So that seems like a lot for everyone to bite off all of a sudden. Um, um, in the report, uh, they did say that an annual rate of $557 per acre it was expected. And so for a single-family resident, approximately um, 8,700 square feet parcel, it would be $111 per year. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I would have a hard time believing that. Uh, means that this uh, study was put together by uh, Bartle Wells. But um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll want a copy of those spreadsheets. Um, and uh, my faith also in this is pretty low right now. Uh, it's a, a compliment, but it says uh, staff expertly caught a mathematical error in the stormwater technical funding memo. So um, I'm assuming that's something to do with the Bartle Wells study. So that's great that staff caught it. So I don't have to go dig it out. Um, <laughs> unfunded mandate, I don't know if there's anything on that. Do we have any, how does that work? It, it, it clearly is an unfunded mandate. Uh, unfortunately, um, both the reality and the court ruling has been that the vast majority of the unfunded mandate comes from uh, the federal government. And although the state in this case has been stuck with most of the implementation, uh, the actual law requiring uh, the stormwater management plans is federal law. And so the courts have ruled that even though it's an unfunded mandate, we can't make the state um, pay us back. There is a small portion where the state has added some additional requirements, and it may be even the one that your staff was mentioning to you tonight. And so cities may end up with the opportunity to get that portion funded from the state, but that's a small part of the overall cost. So it'll be worth paying attention to and, and having the staff go seek reimbursement for that, but it, it's not going to solve the issue for you. You're still stuck right now uh, with the fact that because you don't have a combined system uh, and when you're planning systems, combining them would not have been a good idea here precisely because the stormwater is going to ex exhaust the capacity of your plant if it all just went directly there. Um, absent that, you can't use the fee setting structure in Prop 218, which is a protest hearing. That says, yes, it's a public hearing, uh, and people do get the right to file protests, but absent a protest of 50% plus one vote, you just set the rate. It doesn't have to go to an actual election. The type of process that would have to be followed in this particular That's like what they did, just did in Las Olivas, right? For establishing the, the district there? You're no, the protest this, basically vote? this would be like a tax, and it would actually have to go to, to you, you, you don't have to necessarily time it with the regular elections, but you actually have to have people vote on it. And if people don't vote to assess or tax themselves, you can't impose it. Mm -hmm. Exactly, just like the TOT increase. That had to go to the voters. Uh, and this type of fee would have to go to the voters too. Um, and it will, yeah, it's, it's a, in non-legal terms. But, but it wouldn't be one of those fees that you put it in place and then they, uh, it has to be more than 50% of the people protesting in order, no. in order to stop it. No, they would this have would to have vote to vote this to one a, in. They have to vote okay. to tax themselves. Got it. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then you aren't going to solve your problem with 
and, and I'm not recommending against increasing the impact fee, mm -hmm. but your impact fee is going to be paid by so few people, and you can only make new development pay its share of cost. Mm -hmm. So we can't make a new developer coming to town contribute pay for all of it. to yeah. Every, yeah, so you can't. So it's it's not going to you're not going to get out of it that way either. Uh, so it's mm. yeah, it's going to be something you're going to want to think long and hard about because um, it's a legitimate expenditure of your general fund money. There's nothing mm -hmm. in the law that says you can't use your general fund money to pay for these expenses. You aren't required to, to make your citizens come out of their own pocket mm -hmm. directly for it. And you'll have to balance that as you balance everything when you look at your general fund expenditures and what your water rates are. I mean, the point of adding the stormwater into the sewer system would be to have the sewer system pay for it which it, that's just another way of having the, the rate payers mm -hmm. make the payment. And fine, you would only have to do the protest hearing, you wouldn't have to go to vote, but it's still the same issue and it's still the same, same wallets, mm -hmm. same balance. It's gonna be a tough one for you guys to, to do and it's not gonna go away fast. Sorry. Yeah, just to add um, to the city attorney's comments. So right now our uh, drainage impact fee covers like 0.1 percent of our whole program costs mm -hmm. but if if we do update it uh it would only get it's only going to cover between five and ten percent probably more like seven or eight mm -hmm. percent of the total program but it's better than 0.1 percent <laughs> and uh, of course there's nothing that has to be uh, done uh, imminently uh we're funding it through the general fund uh, the staff is just our desires to bring it to your attention that this is like a growing cost and we just want to make sure that we're uh, funding this program the way you want it funded and if you want to make any change you know or, or give us some direction to pursue something we're happy to do that uh, and kind of like uh, Roy was saying the Bartlewell's best recommendation is this prop 218 process that which is it's 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 highly unlikely it would ever pass, you mm -hmm. know, as you can tell. So it's not a really good option, but that, they're saying that that's the best option. Uh, so um, there's not a lot of good options, but, um, but one thing the city council could uh, do is just direct staff just to wait for the next uh, six to 12 months, see what happens with this SB, um, uh, what is it, 231. Uh, but if that does pass, it's basically just gonna uh, create a stormwater utility and now if you're not gonna, uh, or you could create a stormwater utility, and instead of funding the stormwater utility with general fund money, you could impose a, um, a, 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 like just like we have water rates, you could impose a stormwater rate. So it's, which I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, staff's not recommending you do one or the other, we're just trying to give you all the information, so. Well, I think I think this is going is a great uh, staff report put together. Um, uh, I guess I'm probably siding on just uh, like my preference. I guess would be a table until that SB uh, 231. Uh, we, we we would recommend though that you direct staff to um, uh, update the drainage impact fee. So even if we yeah, oh that that fee that you're saying would would help get us to like yeah. seven to ten. Yeah. And again, that would be fees paid by developers. Not, not residents. Mm -hmm. And what kind of fees are we talking about? Like, like. Uh, uh, well, in the report, they've got this graphic here on on page seventy one. It shows uh, they uh, Bartle Wells did did actually do a good job uh, on this part of the, the study. They looked at drainage uh, impact fees um, for a number of different cities around the state, and the, the average is um, around uh, uh, twenty six hundred dollars, and ours is a hundred dollars. Well, 500 for commercial, 100 for residential, and the average is 2,500. So our, ours could be so above 2,500 dollars. So an example, like what did Mercantile just pay to do what they? Yeah, it was 500. 500, 500 dollars. And then what what would this update that new fee to be? Uh, they they probably would have had to pay um, in the neighborhood of um, 5,000 dollars.
Yeah, it, it's not going to be the solution. We have limited right. development left, so obviously. In fact, fees aren't. Yeah, we're going to need hundred thousand. We're going to be in trouble. <laughs> well, fees are dropping the bucket. Uh, we forgot to uh, mention one thing. Um, you may be aware SB one was the the gas tax and diesel fuel tax that's going to be implemented here soon. Um, November first. Yeah. So uh, uh, the first payment that Solvang is the estimate of the first payment we're going to receive uh, under that. Um, is uh, I think 20, uh, I mean, yeah, $28,000 for this first year. It's like a partial year. And then next year, it's estimated to be about 92,000. So we're projecting from year to year, uh, the SB1 funds we're gonna receive are in the order of um, uh, 90 to $100,000 each year. And so um, one of the things we're, staff is uh, gonna propose to you um, in our capital improvement program here in, in, in a month is um, that we uh, initially use those funds to help out, uh, uh, to help fund some of the storm drain capital improvement projects. So that takes a little bit of the burden off of the um, general fund for the um, stormwater management program. Hmm. That's some good news. We're tr trying to do everything. <laughs> Mr. Deuce. Um, I'm tired of the federal and the state shoving stuff up, you know where, to us. So they can look good and say, we're not raising taxes. It's coming out of somebody's pockets. It's coming out of yours and mine, whether it's a federal tax, a state tax, or a, or a local tax. It's a bunch of crap. Why don't they just call it what it is? And tax, they're the ones that are making the laws. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the development fees, we've, we've got no, we've got no, nothing to develop ar around here. We've got a few little parcels left. Um, nothing's going to come in from it. We've got a, One of the things that I have looked at, and, and you know, wait, waiting for this, whatever SB, whatever the, the, the bill is, um, that's just another way of not having to go through a 218, and uh, it, it, uh, we, we don't have to vote on it. It just becomes, it's, it's another utility. Um, I don't like that either. It um, a couple of years ago, I was trying to figure out how to um, take some of our general fund TOT money, if you want to call it that. I call it TOT uh, because that's that's one of the uh, one of our big drivers into our. Um, into our uh, general fund, and um, you know, one one of the things when we um, when we increased from ten to twelve percent, that twenty percent increase was uh, to make sure that um, that the that the people of Solvang got something out of it, and uh, th this was when we were when I was talking about water rates, if there was a way to work that. I'm going to propose this same scenario. Yes, it's general fund, but this is a way that every resident of Solvang can benefit. It might not pay the whole bill, but I can pay a bunch of the bill. And um, rather than, rather than uh, playing around, we take a look at what we do with our grants. They do a lot of good, but do they touch every single resident? I don't think so. 
This way. This way. We can touch every every resident, every ratepayer rate in this in this city. That's what my recommendation is. Ms. Jameson. That's an interesting concept, Hans. Um, I've always been a proponent to helping the nonprofits help the people of Solvang. And if you want to take all those funds away, you have a cat fight on your hands because I wouldn't go for that at all. Um, but something has to be done, and I don't, personally, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I, I'm curious about the two creeks that run through town that, are, that come from wherever they come from and the trash that comes down in them. How, how are we responsible for other people's trash that comes into, in, along those creeks? If I miss anything, Bridget can add. Uh, so technically, we're not responsible for trash that's coming, like, for example, down the San Inez uh, River or, or down Alma Alamo Pintado Creek. And Adobe or, Creek. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, we're just primarily responsible for um, preventing any trash generated for in Solvang. For catching it. Yeah. Well, but. Generated in Solvang. So we don't have to. So the, like, for example, the trash amendment that Bridget mentioned. Uh, the the structures to capture that trash would be um, constructed uh, along our existing storm drain pipes and and capture the trash uh, and this would be for um, low and, and, and sort of moderate storms the the large storms would overwhelm a system like that and, and, and you're allowed under the permit you know to not have to capture every piece of trash um, on those larger storms but um, but anyway, you trap, capture the trash, and the water would flow by and discharge into the creek or the river. So the, uh, the permit allows for that. So we don't have to be concerned with the trash that's coming down those creeks? Correct. Really? Yeah, we have to prevent trash that we in Solvang generate from adding to that. But theoretically, the, the county would be responsible right. in their plan to keep trash generated in the county area from getting into the creek and coming our way. Okay, what's the definition of trash? <laughs> it's, a, it's a lengthy, <laughs> lengthy <laughs> it's like a whole, whole paragraph. Yeah, definition. it's just, it's okay, is it anything. Like, is it like parts of tree, anything yes. that's not organic? No, it, oh, no. It can be organic. Yeah, yeah, trash is a very wrong leaves, word for me to have used. Leaves are considered. Leaves, un, okay. Un what about logs and stuff that come down the creeks? Those are not our uh, well, okay. I mean, I'm looking, at, trash, I'm looking at our prop. I'm looking at property trash within the city. Is more focused on um, uh, municipal storm drain systems, not so much the creeks and rivers. That it's preventing it from getting into those locations. So there's a lot of trash in those creeks, though. <laughs> in in. Uh, uh, all the county actually also has a stormwater permit, so the the yeah, creeks they, are coming they, from the county property. They have jurisdiction over those. Well, I, re creeks. I remember when flood control used to walk the creeks before the rain comes, not like they used to, and they used to get rid of a lot of the trash in the creeks because they knew where it was going to end up. It was going to end up in the river. Can you ask and see if they still do that? Well, I know that the um, the county, in fact, is going to be here in just a couple weeks uh, on uh, uh, Alamo Pintado Creek and um, Adobe Creek to uh, uh, remove um, vegetation and logs. And oh, good. Trees. I was wondering when yeah. that was going to happen. They, they, they actually are on a cycle to come through Solving every two years and, and do just those two creeks. Okay. They're the only, only ones they, they address. So all that dead debris that's in Adobe Creek is going to be gone. Right. Yeah. Hopefully. Well, we received a notification. That's their intention. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't know okay. how good of a job they'll do, but I'm sure they'll do their best. So. Okay. I'm really disappointed in uh, Bartles and Wells about them suggesting we tax our people to take care of this problem. You know, it's a, it's the first thing out of everybody's mouth, tax, tax, tax. This, uh, this staff report showed 
that there's an $800,000 a year bill that's coming to us for the next five years at least. And it's a big snowball. It's coming rolling down the hill on us. It's going to hit us bigger and bigger every year. And right now the numbers are $4 million in five years. And, and I think that, uh, that our, it's our job to go over the way we spend money before we tax our folks. Uh, you know, I've always said that, that the people of Solvang should benefit from our tourist business. And we do that by contributing to nonprofits. And we could do that by a fin a financing uh, the SCVB and, and, the S and the Chamber of Commerce. I think it's time to take a look at what we're getting for our money in those organizations. Uh, just a quick, per just a quick uh, look at the uh, nonprofits. I think we could eliminate twenty-five thousand dollars worth of, of contribution to the nonprofits right off the bat, and in uh, in others uh, we could cut back. Uh, and I ask I ask the staff to to get me some charts. I haven't received them yet. Uh, charts showing the profit, the our our, uh, our annual surplus of our of our revenues, also percentages of increases between. Uh, years that we pay to the uh, nonprofits and we pay to the SCVB, and comparisons, uh, so and a bar chart showing the major uh, ca category expense categories that in our budget, is showing the surplus at the top is how much is our surplus decreasing, increasing every year, and those sorts of things. I want to see that stuff before we determine we're going to tax the people. Uh, so I would recommend that we sit back and wait until we get those kinds of numbers so that we can make an, uh, a judgment on how we're, how we're really going to pay for this. And I think that the first words out of our mouth should not be tax. Our, we ought to look, you know, when uh, in our own personal finances, we don't go out and spend money that we don't have. We try to find out a way to spend money by cutting back on other expenses. And so uh, I would encourage us to put a hold on this particular issue until we get some more facts on how we're going to handle it. And I don't think that, uh, that taxing folks is a necessary uh, thing that we do first. So with that, I, would, I want to recommend that we uh, table this item until we get some more facts. And uh, I would make that motion, and I'm looking for a second. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Any comments? Yeah, I think we don't stop with the, just a light trim. I think we go for a deep dive haircut and maybe even scalp the deal. Exactly. I think that it's time that we look at our budgets. We're, we're, we've been very generous to the folks, and I think it's time that they, we have to understand that we're going to have some costs that are going to really hurt us. And it's a state mandate, and it's going to happen. We can't change that. So we have to find a way to survive with it. And there are other uh, sources of revenues, but I think we ought to look in our own house first. Any other comments? Seeing none, can I have a, a roll call vote? It's been moved and seconded. Mayor Richardson? Yes. Council Member Toussaint? Yes. Deuce? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Zimmerman? Yes. And that passed with a 5 0 to table the, to table the uh, issue until we get more until we get more information. Thank you. Item number nine. Item nine League of California Cities designation of voting delegate and direction on Solving's position on proposed resolutions. Staff report. Uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, this is your annual choosing of a voting delegate, which I think will be fairly easy this year. There's only one council member who's indicated a desire to go to the annual conference, which is September 13th through 15th in Sacramento, and that's council member Toussaint. Um, so you would appoint him as the voting delegate, and then he would uh, need to vote on there's two uh, resolutions that they have. It, it's within your packet. Um, one is a resolution calling upon the governor and legislator, legislature to enter into discussions with the league and other public safety stakeholders to identify and implement strategies that will reduce the unintended negative impacts of existing criminal law. And the other one is a resolution supporting legislation amending government code section 38611 to clarify the definition of local control, providing broad statutory authority for local officials to determine emergency service levels and direct emergency medical response in within their jurisdictions. Uh, neither of these resolutions have a direct impact on the city of Solvang, but uh, the league does request that you, uh, uh, the city, take a position on the resolutions. And so that's what we'd be looking for, for direction for your appointed uh, voting delegate. Uh, is there any questions, staff report? Seeing none, the, I have no sp uh, speaker slips for public comment. Does anybody wish to comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council for uh, discussion and direction. Anybody have any comments? Can I have a motion? 
Would you like to make your own motion? I'll make a motion. So, so you'll you'll need, you'll oh, yeah, yeah. yeah it, so the the key action to take you can approve the resolution disapprove no action or refute to refute refer to appropriate policy committee so I would assume approve the resolutions uh, is the recommendation right yeah yeah is there a second I'll second it I'm gonna have a voice vote all those in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed abstain abstain Four one four zero one abstention. That passes. But you can't abstain when you're there. You have to vote <laughs> for them. <laughs> you caught me. <laughs> Council member reports. Do we have any? I guess not. And on. Uh, we, well, yeah, we met with ID1. Uh, we had ad hoc uh, meeting with them. And um, let's see here. We kind of just rehashed some stuff that we had talked about in the past. Um, you know, m possible merger or what, you know, and then it's just generally kind of what's going on. Um, and it goes to the back to the same thing as far as like. Are we, you know, what duties would be divided up, water management, billing, no and M. So um, if you want us to do more research into possibly looking into a merger or handing off some services or, I don't know, kind of looking for direction on where we want to go. Um, uh, well, let's see, uh, there was one thing that I wrote down here. Um, well, no, I'll, I'll bring that up later. Um, but yeah, so we're kind of looking for direction, really. Do we do we want to move forward with uh, trying to work something out with ID One? What, what what is your position on it? As far as you're, you're during your during your uh, meetings with them, do you have a do you have a thought that comes to you that the, the action we should take, or should we stay high centered, as they said, to speak between on between the two ideas? I mean, there could be some benefits there. It really depends on. I guess with you know with the river wells and whatnot. Um, I guess what I see is, we you know the p potential of going wet or uh, east and drilling farther that way, but but having more of a partnership deal on the well or the permit or um, I don't know. I think there's some options there that we can entertain, and it may not ha may not be a full merger. It, it could be. Um, partial partnership type of deal on and you know just bettering our our kind of bond I guess and then uh, mm. but we have to look to see what well, I guess would really work for both of us like where if, if there if there's cost savings there for us mainly if they took over like say operation maintenance or something uh, have, have you f formulated a set of options that we should we could look at no that's kind of what I'm wondering if we should even if you want us to go that or where, where are we? If where there's really no hope and it's like we don't want to do that, we're okay, then we don't want to like go forward with putting in all the extra time, whatever. Opinions? Questions? What's, what's the feeling you get from ID1? I mean, they're open. They're definitely open. And, and it's, it, would, it looks, it was what it looks like, it would be probably us four, the ad hoc, that would probably have to like actually dig down because we're not, no one's really looking to spend a bunch of money on like surveys and you know professional services so we would have to kind of use the best of our knowledge to um, figure out some of the savings or where we can offload some of the uh, responsibilities or, or whatever on either side um, so it would be work that we'd have to put in personally and, and, and the two other members from ID1. Uh, have, you, have you conferenced with city manager maybe the attorney to get a kind of a of a groundwork or a groundwork idea to which which way we might want to go? Is there a way that we can help that way from the staff? And what it, you know that we were here we're in a in a permitting process with the state yeah. in the river, you know. And I, I would I would say that um, th from a, a legal perspective, uh, a merger is significantly easier than the the old 
proposal, which was to have us detach because if, first of all, you're already physically connected. All the Solvang residents are already in ID1. Uh, you don't risk losing secure water sources for your Solvang residents with a merger. So none of the legal concerns that I had with the detachment pending mm -hmm. the river water being worked out exist. In, in fact, just in the theoretical world here, because that's all we're at right now, um, I could see merger solving the river well issue in, in a way um, that's not only easier, but probably better. W would you suggest a, a merger that with a new board of directors uh, with, or with a JPA or something along those lines rather than, rather than Tilting it one way or the other between solving and well, ID one. Yeah, well, you could you could examine all of all of those, but the, the 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 concept of merger in my brain, from a legal perspective, is since it really is one water system. The question is who the survivors should be. Well, exactly, and, and or should I, there, it's there well, it's done. Yeah, I've seen it done both ways. Um, joint powers uh, and where one agency just gives up serving water. The distinct advantage from a legal perspective and a process perspective in this situation is that since Solvang is already completely within ID1, you don't have to get LAFCO's permission for ID1 to serve water here. Were we to try and have for instance, if we wanted to put on the table, have ID1 give up water and let Solvang run the whole water department, that would be a whole LAFCO process because our s area of service doesn't include the rest of ID1. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not practical to do that and that's no reflection on, it's not reflecting an opinion from me about um, staff and how well your staff runs a water department. That's just the practical way to address it if you want to have one system instead of two separate systems. And like I said, the, the legal risks that gave me real concern over the attachment process don't exist because mm -hmm. my fear was losing secure sources of water for Solvang residences as a result of that. Um, that can't happen if you figure out a mutually acceptable way to merge the system. Does, does this agenda item allow us to discuss that in more detail right now? I, I wouldn't, well, yes, but I wouldn't recommend any more detail than, than that at this point because um, your ad hoc committee members are going to want to, in essence, conduct some negotiation with the other ad hoc committee members, and I wouldn't want to shoot them in the foot or limit them unduly. Can, can we allow the, the, the council to give them some direction? Yeah. Okay. I think that's really what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, the, so the question becomes: His recommendation of a merger, you know, sounds okay. Okay. Now, rem remember, yeah. I, I, I'm no, I'm I'm just describing the legal right. ramifications right. and the fact that the concerns I had with the detachment don't exist in a, in a merger situation. Right. So, from a legal perspective, it's a whole different process, and it doesn't expose your citizens to the risk of, of losing secure sources of water. You've heard him. Who's, uh, who's on, is it, is it still uh, Kevin and um, Jeff, yeah, uh, same Kevin guy. and Jeff? And those are good guys. Yeah. Okay, if we merge, then we share the financial responsibilities. That's kind of what I mean. If, are if, they going to want? I mean, really, it's like if you guys want to actually entertain, you know, a merger for like in a uh, you know a serious manner, then those are the things that we'd have to dive into a little bit to get the detail out of. Because are they going to want to accept our financial responsibilities? And likewise, are we going to want to deal with cr the chromium problem that they have? Right, and that's kind of that's so we talked a little bit about that, and it it, it may actually be beneficial to both because we can lend each other's essentially resources and it can you know take care of one thing and it might I mean it, it could be a benefit you know having the treatment 
and having the, the reliable water. Harlan's around, it ain't going to happen. We talked about that a little bit, too. <laughs> hey, Har Harlan surprised me one time. I'm not going to say why, but he did. <laughs> uh, He's only one vote. I, I th I, I'm getting an idea that maybe that you could look in further into a discussion with merger, you know, and, and uh, some of the detail and bring us, bring, you know, just don't take the general options jump forward, just start, yeah. start developing some options and bring it back to us for us to either say yeah or nay to go on or back off or something. I think that might be a, okay. a reasonable approach. You know. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank Are there any other uh, council any other council uh, member reports? Seeing none, then uh, item twelve, closed session. Please read that. Item twelve. Government Code Section 54957.6, Conference with Labor Negotiators, Agency Representatives, Brad Vidro, City Manager, and Sandra Featherson, Administrative Services Director, Employee Organization Teamsters, Local 986, and Government Code Subdivision A of 54956.9, Existing Litigation, Amendment to Permit 15878 in front of the State Water Resources Control Board. I have one speaker's uh, slip, Fred. Fred Koval Solvang. As I have mentioned in the past, that when they did the negotiation for Chris Dahlstrom, manager for ID number one, that they had a third party negotiator that they hired to remove all possibility of conflicts of interest. We're doing just the opposite here. We have two of the highest staff that are negotiating on our behalf, the city council's behalf, the city's behalf. That's a major conflict of interest. It may not be legally, but sure in the eyes of the public, the ratepayers is very much so. So I recommend to remove all conflict of interest that you cease any further discussion in closed session about this item and hire a third party negotiator so it is perceived if not legally, being no conflict of interest. This is a serious matter because remember what happens. Whatever they negotiate, they're negotiating for their own salary increases also. I mean, it's pure fact that that's what it is. If you proceed with this, holy cow, you guys are up for recall. That's what it really means. Think about it. You just cannot go forward with this. I don't understand, Fred. What, what conflict do you see? Whatever you negotiate with the unions. Are you talking about unions? Yeah. You're not talking about the ID staff. The, the staff has to have an increase to stay above the union rates. It goes hand in hand. I mean, it's simple, it's a no-brainer. I'm surprised you even asked that question, Mayor. He didn't understand. Oh, he didn't understand. I thought you were talking about water. He's throwing the other side back. <laughs> yeah, you're talking, so about Fred's talking about. you're talking about the union contract, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's what I filled I in the form that for. Up initially. Okay, now I understand why you didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll adjourn to closed session. <laughs>